Uh, as Tim said, I'm going to speak about um, spiritual awakening and how spiritual awakening can be triggered by psychological turmoil, both on a temporary basis, you know, in the form of experiences which last for maybe a few seconds, a few minutes, maybe a few hours, but also on an ongoing or stable basis when people shift into an ongoing state of spiritual wakefulness, which becomes their normal state. And usually once a person shifts into that state, it becomes permanent. It becomes their normal everyday state. And so it's surprisingly common. A lot of people think that spiritual awakening is a kind of esoteric and unusual phenomenon, which is to a degree, but I think it's much more common than most people realize, particularly when it occurs on a, in a spontaneous context, context, outside the context of spiritual traditions or spiritual practices often to people who don't know anything about spirituality. And we're going to look into some examples of that this afternoon. Well, maybe I thought it might be a good idea to begin with a meditation. Would you, would you like to begin with a, a short meditation? Yeah, let's begin with a, a few minutes of meditation, just to empty our minds and settle into this session. And I'm also a poet, so I'll, I'll lead a short meditation and then read a short poem. So maybe, maybe first of all, let's close our eyes for a moment. And just bring your attention to your, your breathing for a moment. Feel the air brushing the inside of your nose as you breathe in and as you breathe out. Feel how your stomach expands and contracts with your breath. Just follow your breathing for two or three more breaths, paying attention to that sensation of the air brushing the inside of your nose. If any thoughts come into your mind, just Bring your attention back to your breath rather than allowing your thoughts to take your attention away. Also, be aware of your body and the points where your body touches the environment around you, where your feet touch the ground, where your body touches the chair you're sitting on. Just bring your attention to those points of contact. Be aware of the clothes that you're wearing, pressing gently against your skin. And now for a moment, let's bring our attention inward into our own consciousness, into our own inner space. Just feel the center of your consciousness inside your being. Feel the energy of your consciousness flowing not just through your head, but, but through your whole body, stretching down through your inner body, down towards your chest and your waist, into your legs, into your arms and your hands. Just feel the energy of your inner body vibrating gently filling you with a sense of well-being, a sense of energetic well-being. Again, if any thoughts come into your mind, just don't allow your attention to be taken away. Just bring your attention back 
to your inner body, to the energy of your inner body. And be aware that this inner body has no identity. It's just an energy, a consciousness flowing through you that you share with other people. Let's be aware the, the the energy of our being is shared with everyone around us, with all the other people in this session. It's the same dynamic inner energy flowing through us, like channels of the same river. So let's feel the, the connection between us as this energy flows into all of us at the same time. Let's feel the oneness between us. since we're all just expressions of the same consciousness flowing into different forms. So just for a moment longer, let's feel that connection, that oneness between us all, stretching across the distance between us. Let's return our attention to our bodies for a moment, feeling again the points of contact where our body meets the surfaces around us. And now let's slowly open our eyes again and bring this meditation to a close. This sense of connection and oneness is one of the main qualities that we experience in spiritual awakening. To a large extent, spiritual awakening is a, a transcendence of separateness, a transcendence of the illusion of separateness. I think one of the most pernicious ideas in, in modern scientific culture is that human beings are genetic machines who live in separation, um, who are enclosed inside our own mental space, inside our own bodies, and who can only make contact with one another through touching or through communicating via words. But when we go through spiritual awakening, we realize that that's false, that, it, that essentially we're all interconnected. We're all expressions of the same spiritual force. So here's a, here's a short poem that expresses this idea. This is called, We Are Each Other. We're not ghostly entities marooned inside our mental space with our personal pain and suffering that can never be shared or understood. We're not machines full of selfish genes. We're always scheming to outdo each other and only ever show kindness if there's some benefit to ourselves. We are each other. We feel compassion because we're connected. We sense each other's suffering because we share each other's being. We risk our lives for others because there is only one life. We help and heal and love each other because we are each other. So that's, that's part of what spiritual awakening means, but it, it means other things as well. That, that sense of connection and oneness is just one aspect of spiritual awakening. And I've always thought that, that spiritual awakening is not, 
you know, as I mentioned before, it's not something esoteric. It's not something extraordinary. In some ways, it's quite ordinary. When people experience it, there's a feeling that, wow, this is it. This is, there's a sense of coming home. That's why it feels ordinary, because it, there's a sense that it's a return to our true nature and to the experience we should have had all along. Obviously, various spiritual traditions interpret it in different ways, according to different um, philosophical systems, different conceptual beliefs. But essentially, all traditions express the same experience or different aspects of the same experience. In my view, spiritual awakening is a, it's an expansion and an intensification of awareness across different levels. It's an expansion of awareness in terms of an expansion of identity. We, we realize that our identity is not just enclosed within, within our own bodies. It spreads out into other beings, into the space around us. It spreads out into the whole of the earth, the whole of the cosmos, even the whole of the universe. We realize that there is something inside us which is shared with everything else, an essential consciousness or being. Also in perceptual terms, the world around us becomes more intense and more alive and more beautiful. There's a sense of freshness, a sense of beauty and curiosity and appreciation. Also, there's a sense of expansion in terms of sharing our identity with other people. We connect with other living beings, other human beings in compassion and empathy and altruism. But also within our own being, we expand in terms of exploring our own inner being in a way that we never did before. We realize that there are lots of depths and potentials and energies within us, which we were never aware of. There's a sense that before we were just living on the surface of our beings, but now we dive into this deep ocean of our inner being and we discover aspects of ourselves which we were never aware of before. So there's an expansion and an intensification across all of those different areas. Also in our sense of, uh, in a conceptual sense, in our sense of how we look at the world, we no longer think in terms of group identity, in terms of nationality or uh, ethnic identity or religious identity. We transcend all that and there's a sense of communion with all human beings, no matter how superficially different they may appear. And we transcend our own personal problems and have a more global outlook. Things like, um, you know, uh, social problems, global problems seem more real because we've transcended our egocentric, our normal egocentric condition. So let me share a couple of slides now just to make, um, make these ideas a bit clearer and then I'll explain some of the research I've been doing over the past 15 years or so since I became involved with um, transpersonal psychology. By the way, if you're not aware of it, transpersonal psychology is uh, literally means beyond the self. So it's the psychology which examines experiences uh, which take us beyond the self. And also spiritual practices and paths which take us beyond the self on an, on an ongoing or permanent basis. So, yeah, hopefully you can see my slides now. Yep. Can you see my slides? Yep. Great. What I'll do is I'll leave them in this form because sometimes when I make them full screen, for some reason, it seems to freeze the, the PowerPoint presentation. So I'll just leave them like that, like this, if it's OK. So. Uh, when I was a teenager, I had a lot of uh, unusual experiences. Maybe I was 16, 17 years old. I had altered, I experienced altered states of consciousness when I would feel connected to my surroundings, when everything around me would come to life and seem incredibly beautiful and real. And there was a sense that I was somehow being lifted out of myself and I was becoming one with something bigger than myself. And there was a feeling that everything around me was part of a oneness. And I didn't understand these experiences at the time. I thought maybe they were, you know, they were a sign that I was crazy. And obviously I didn't tell anybody about them because I, I suspected that other people would think I was crazy. But later, um, I, think, I think one of the reasons why I became involved in transpersonal psychology was because I wanted to understand these experiences. I recognized later on that they were what you could call spiritual experiences or mystical experiences, and that they were not uncommon. 
So I wasn't crazy after all. Or maybe I was, but other people were crazy too. So I had a sense of orientation, a sense of uh, a framework to make sense of my experiences. So when I became involved in transpersonal psychology, I did some research on these type of experiences, which I called awakening experiences, because it literally seems as if we're awakening from a sleep state in these experiences. There's a sense in which the world becomes more real and our vision becomes more intense. So let me ask you this question now. I'll ask you this question now. You can re respond in the chat box if you like. Have you ever had an awakening experience in which your awareness of reality has intensified and expanded? This could be an experience in which your surroundings have become brighter and more real, and you become struck by the unusual beauty and vividness of things. Perhaps you felt a sense of connection to them and a deep sense of well-being inside you. Or perhaps you have felt a sense of harmony and meaning pervade the world, a sense that all things are one and you are part of this oneness. The experience may have left you with a sense that life is more meaningful. So, um, yeah, have you ever had that type of experience? If you like, you could also mention the, uh, the situation when this experience occurred, because these experiences are often, they're often um, related to certain situations or activities, as we'll see in a moment. So some people have the, I, I get these type of experiences quite frequently when I'm in, in nature, when I'm in the countryside. I often like to go walking um, uh, between in the hills between Manchester and Leeds in uh, the Calder Valley around Todbarden or Hedman Bridge. And I often get these type of experiences there walking in the countryside. Yeah, Janet says too frequent to mention. Mm hmm. Esoteric awakening. That's true. Yeah, nature is definitely one of the, the main situations when people have these experiences. Sometimes, sometimes they're related to psychedelics. Some people have these experiences after taking uh, psychedelic substances. Sometimes they occur after a meditation. But one of the things I wanted to um, look into in my research was why these experiences occur. You know, are they just random? Um, or are they related to you know, certain psychological states? Is there a reason? why they occurred. Um, you know, romantic poets have written about these experiences like Wordsworth and Shelley, William Blake. And there's always a sense that on the one hand, it's a sense of connection, a sense of oneness. And it's also a sense that a veil has fallen away and you're seeing things as they really are. You're seeing a deeper reality of things, a deeper reality in which everything is interconnected and everything is somehow in harmony Everything is part of something bigger than itself. And everything is somehow, you know, linked together in this vast, overarching harmony. So I wanted to find out why these experiences occur and what situations they're related to. This is what I found in my, in my research. Um, I did two research studies on these experiences. In the last one, which I did with a colleague called Christina Igato Svabo, uh, we studied 91 of these experiences and we found, to our surprise, that the, um, the most significant trigger of them was psychological turmoil, such as stress, depression, loss or bereavement, a wide range of different types of psychological turmoil. So over a third of the experiences were related to psychological turmoil, which seems kind of paradoxical because, you know, obviously these experiences are... You know, they involve deep joy, a sense of meaning and harmony, a transcendence of anxiety. So it seems paradoxical that they should emerge from psychological turmoil. And the other, the other major triggers were contact with nature, which we've already talk, spoken about, spiritual practice, spiritual literature, love stroke sex, watching or listening to an arts performance. So the main triggers were psychological turmoil, contact with nature, and spiritual practice or spiritual literature. So here's a, let me just give you an example of one of these experiences which was triggered by psychological turmoil. This was an experience which was given me by a man who was a soldier 
in Vietnam. This is in 1969 during the American conflict with Vietnam. And he was on the, on the battlefield uh, in a state of high anxiety. Well, this is, this is how he described it. With casualties mounting, I was in a state of high anxiety and I figured there was no way I would live through this seemingly endless battle. At one point, after carrying yet another severely wounded Marine to a waiting chopper, something happened to me. It's actually indescribable, but I'll make a feeble attempt to do so. I opened up, literally from my perspective. I came out of myself. I expanded infinitely. I disappeared. It didn't last long, but it was the most powerful experience I've ever had. This guy didn't have a background in spirituality, so he wasn't really sure what to make of the experience, but it was the most, as he says, it was the most meaningful and powerful experience he'd ever had. When he returned to America after the war, he, he knew instinctively that this experience was related to spirituality. So he, he learned about Buddhism. He started to meditate. He started to be trained as a counselor because he felt this new empathic connection to people. But he said that he'd never managed to recapture this experience, even though he'd had similar glimpses. But just the knowledge that this type of experience was there had a very powerful effect on him. It changed his life and gave rise to a, um, a lifelong spiritual search. Here's another example. This was a young woman who had been suffering from depression. She was actually in hospital following a suicide attempt. And for some reason, when she woke up one morning in hospital, there was a, a marble on her bedside table. She had no idea how it got there. That's why there's a marble on the slide here. But she picked up this marble and started to look at it. And this is how she described her experience. She said, I saw reality as simply this perfect oneness. I felt suddenly removed from everything that was personal. Everything seemed just right. All my problems and my suffering suddenly seemed meaningless, ridiculous, simply a misunderstanding of my true nature and everything around me. There was a feeling of acceptance and oneness. It was a moment of enlightenment. The euphoria and inexplicable rush of knowledge and understanding following this episode lasted for days. Although this was a, a temporary experience, it had a a permanent impact just like the previous just as in the previous example it gave her the awareness that there was this new realm of harmony and meaning which was there but which she'd never sensed before so it gave her a new sense of optimism a sense of trust and so after the experience she began to emerge from her her depression into a new positive phase of her life so although these, although these experiences are temporary they maybe last for just a few seconds they can be incredibly powerful. They can change a person's life just by opening up a new dimension of spirituality, a new dimension of harmony and meaning. But one thing I began to find when I did these did, did my research on these experiences, some people, they, they didn't just talk about temporary experiences which faded away after a while. Some people told me that it wasn't a temporary experience. It was a, a shift into an entirely different state of being, which became the normal permanent state. So some people reported a permanent shift into a, a different spiritual state of being. And this relates to um, a theory in psychology, which is really based on this question, which I'll ask you now. Here's another question. Have you ever had a bad experience involving stress, upset, suffering, and turmoil, which you feel in the end made you a stronger and happier person. So again, you can, you can write yes or no in the chat box or just nod your head if you like. Mm -hmm, that's right. Reb says they are catalysts for personal transformation. Mm hmm. In psychology, this is what is known as post traumatic growth. It's well known. There's tons of research showing that in the aftermath of 
crises or challenging personal experiences, human beings undergo long-term personality changes for the better. People become more grateful for their lives. They feel more resilient. They feel stronger, more confident, more competent. Their relationships become stronger, more authentic and more intimate. There's a whole range of different areas where people grow in the aftermath of traumatic experiences. It doesn't really matter what the trauma is. Even really intense forms of trauma can have this effect. And it, it's, it's surprisingly common. Research shows that, some research shows that almost a half of people undergo post-traumatic growth in the aftermath of, of trauma. Usually between, research shows it's usually between a third and a half of people undergo post-traumatic growth. So the phenomenon I'm going to talk about now, where people shift into a higher state of being following turmoil and trauma, it's in, in a sense, it's a kind of post-traumatic growth. But I call it transformation through turmoil because it's a, it's a very intense form of post-traumatic growth. Well, people don't just gradually change. They suddenly and dramatically shift into a different state. And just as, like, just as in post-traumatic growth, it doesn't really matter what type of trauma it is. It, this, it can range from illness like cancer. It can range from bereavement, depression, disability, addiction, loss. Many people who go through these experiences, they report a sudden dramatic transformation into a higher functioning state, which is equivalent to spiritual awakening. Even if it happens to people who don't know about spirituality, who don't have a background in spiritual paths and practices, it is equivalent to a shift into a state of spiritual wakefulness. It sometimes happens in prisoners. Actually, this is in my new book, Extraordinary Awakenings. I had, to, I had to have two chapters on spiritual awakening in prison because I found it was so common. There were many examples that I found of prisoners who would undergo a sudden shift of identity. And I thought long and hard about why is this transformation not uncommon in prison? You know, why does it seem to be especially strongly related to, to prison? And... Um, I thought that there were probably two reasons. One is that uh, in prison, there's a lot of inactivity, a lot of solitude. So people are forced to, to look inside themselves. They're forced to look into their own minds and examine themselves. They're forced to reflect in a way that they would probably never do in ordinary life when, when we're busy and distracted. Um, so that's one reason. It, it forces people to enter into themselves and reflect on themselves, which can be revelatory when that happens to people. I think the second reason is that in prison, you have to let go of things. The things that define your identity are on the other side of the prison wall. You know, the, the roles that you have, your relationships, your possessions, your status and success, it's all out there on the other side. So in prison, you've got to let go of these things, which can be a painful experience. But that, that letting go can lead to an awakening. So, yeah, I think that's the reason probably why it's so common in prison. There are lots of parallels between the monastic lifestyle and the, you know, the lifestyle of prisoners. The difference is really that monks choose to be to separate themselves and to let go of all attachments. Whereas in, whereas in prison, it happens by force. And obviously, prison is a much more turbulent environment. But there's definitely a, a parallel there. I found that it's also not uncommon in addicts. People who go through a long process of loss following or, or, or in the midst of an addiction to alcohol or drugs, you know, towards the end of that long process of loss, they may suddenly, they may suddenly undergo a transformation in which in some cases they, they experience what I call addiction release, which is a sudden freedom from, from craving. We'll look at an example of that in a moment. It's quite a kind of miraculous, mysterious experience when people who are who have suffered from long-term addictions are suddenly released from the addiction in the midst of a, a spiritual awakening. So people who go through this experience, they, they describe it as a, a new identity, a shift into a new, new identity. It's almost as if there is a, a latent higher self inside them 
which was waiting to emerge but never had the chance to express itself. But when the normal a person's normal identity breaks down due to this long process of loss or due to a bereavement or, or an encounter with death, suddenly this latent higher self has the chance to emerge and to, to install itself, if you like, as a, as a new identity. So people sometimes say, it's like there are two people. There's a before and an after, or there's no going back. I'm a different person for the rest of my life. One person ex described it quite poetically in terms of the transformation a caterpillar goes through during the chrysalis stage before emerging as a butterfly. So it's a, it's a very profound experience. And let me, give, let me give you a couple of examples just to make it more, more real. This was a lady I interviewed called Irene Murray uh, from Manchester. And she, she was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 42. At that time, she was a, a successful professional person. If I remember rightly, she was a marketing, uh, sorry, she was an IT a person working for a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company, IT manager, I think. Uh, so she was diagnosed with cancer and told that her cancer was aggressive and advanced, and she probably only had six to nine months left to live. But rather than being devastated by the diagnosis, she experienced a kind of liberation straight away. This is how she described her reaction. This was straight after she was diagnosed. She said... It was the first time I'd seen death as a reality and realized that life is just temporary. The following day, I woke up and thought, I'm just so lucky to be alive. The fact that I'm still here. The air was so clean and fresh and everything I looked at seemed so vibrant and vivid. The trees were so green and everything was so alive. I be became aware of this energy radiating from the trees. I had a tremendous feeling of connectedness. She expected that it would be a temporary experience, but it did become less intense, but it became established as an ongoing trait for her. She said, the feeling was really intense for the first few weeks and it's remained ever since. It just blew me away, it really did. I used to just sit and think, this is amazing that things could just fall into place so quickly. Again, it seems paradoxical that she would react like this straight after she was diagnosed with cancer, but it's not. Actually, an uncommon experience. I've found several examples of people reacting in this way. And as you probably guessed, uh, her cancer fortunately went into remission. And even though the cancer went away, she remained in this heightened state. So she felt incredibly lucky that she'd undergone this shift and been able to live the rest of her life in this state. And I think for her, like, like many people, this experience really came about through becoming aware of death. You know, so many human beings take life for granted. We, we don't really see ourselves as mortal beings who only have a certain amount of time on this planet. So when you become aware of the reality of death, that death is real and, you know, life is fragile and temporary and precious, that everything changes, you know, everything becomes precious. Life itself becomes precious. The world becomes precious. So, you know, she was incredibly lucky to, to have that awareness and survive in that heightened state. Uh, let me give you another example. There's, there's a couple here, but I'll, I'll just use this one. Uh, this was a woman called Eve, a Scottish woman from Edinburgh. And you can see her on the photos. This on the right, the photo on the right is Eve just after she'd undergone her transformation at the end of her long period of alcoholism. You can see that she looks physically, um, you know, in, in a physically bad shape there. And this is Eve on the left. That's Eve now, uh, 11 years after her transformation. So she was, uh, she was an alcoholic for 29 years. She started drinking at the age of 10. And it got worse and worse as time went by. And so at the end, like a lot of alcoholics, she, you know, she'd, she'd burned every bridge. She'd, she'd lost everything. She'd lost her relationships because people didn't trust her anymore. She couldn't hold down a job. Um, her family had broken contact with her. She had no possessions, no ambitions, nothing. 
And at the end, she was homeless. She was living on the streets in Edinburgh, just going shoplifting to, you know, to keep drinking. And she eventually, you know, she gave up hope. She tried to stop drinking, but couldn't. So she decided, you know, there was no hope. And she de- she decided to attempt suicide. She did attempt suicide. She tried to throw herself in a bus in front of a coach that was going from Glas- from Edinburgh to Glasgow. But luckily, the driver swerved and she survived. And it seems to have been right at that moment that she underwent a transformation just in the process of attempting and surviving her suicide attempt. Um, she thought she was going to get arrested, but the police came and the policeman was a nice guy and said, you know, you know, can I, can I help you somewhere? Can I take you somewhere? Can I drive you somewhere? So the policeman drove her to a parent's house rather than arresting her. And her parents, her mother thought that she had to give her a drink because she was an alcoholic. And her mother great gave her a glass of wine, but she couldn't drink it. She said that she picked up the glass, lifted it, put it down, kept picking it up and put it down. And somehow it wasn't her that was putting it down. Then she looked in, at herself in the mirror and this is how she described it. She said, it was one of the most surreal experiences I've, I've ever had. I had no idea who I was. I didn't connect with my reflection. I felt like a completely different person. Then she was given some medication to help deal with the withdrawal symptoms. And once she emerged from the withdrawal symptoms, she realized that she was a, a different person. She said that my whole psyche changed completely. I have no trauma in spite of all the terrible things I went through. It was like being catapulted from one world into the next. And just as with Irene, um, Eve has remained in that state for the last 11 years. She hasn't had any, you know, any desire to drink for 11 years. And she's felt this new sense of connection to everybody around her and to, to nature. And she's felt this new sense of ongoing well-being. Um, so as I say, that's an example of the phenomenon which I call addiction release. And also it's a general example of transformation through turmoil. Well, one of the, the characteristics which people often talk about in these experiences is a new awareness of the world around them. They often talk about how nature seems incredibly beautiful in a way it never did before, but just incredibly real. Things seem much more real than they ever did before. It's as if, you know, they were so immersed inside themselves before that they couldn't really look at the world around them. They were so kind of immersed in their own selfishness and their own needs and desires that the world around them barely existed. Other people barely existed. But once they switch into this awakened state, you know, they feel much more connected to other people and much more aware of the reality of the world around them. So it is, it is an awakening in a very literal sense. The world becomes much more real. Their vision becomes much more intense. Well, one, one thing I wanted to look into my, in my research is why these experiences occur. You know, why do people undergo this, um, this remarkable transformation in the midst of psychological turmoil? Because obviously not everybody undergoes it. I mean, we all go through turmoil and trauma in our lives you know as the buddha said life involves suffering and not everybody goes through this transformation a lot of people will experience post-traumatic growth in a gradual sense but not so many people undergo this dramatic and sudden spiritual awakening but first of all i want to work out you know what why why does this experience occur and i believe that it's related to what i call well partly related to ego dissolution that means that our normal sense of identity, which we've developed through our whole lives, uh, dissolves away. You know, our normal sense of who we are as human beings, based on our past experiences, based on the way we think about the world, that dissolves away. A bit like, uh, you know, in the same way that in, the, in an earthquake, a building collapses. And psychological turmoil can be so intense that it's like an earthquake and it breaks down the structure of our normal ego. That can also happen through what I call uh, the the breaking down of psychological attachments. By psychological attachments, I mean things like uh, our sense of status, our sense of achievement, the roles that we have in society. Uh, I mean, our ambitions for the future, our goals, our possessions, 
our knowledge, all of these things are attachments which give us a sense of identity. We feel that we know who we are because of our beliefs, our ambitions, our possessions, our relationships, and so on and so forth. But when we go through intense turmoil and trauma, like a diagnosis of cancer or bereavement or intense depression, then these attachments are broken down, which is why these experiences are so painful. The breaking down of attachments and the dissolution of, identi of our identity is a painful experience. But because our ego is made up of these attachments, they are like the building blocks of the ego, then when the attachments are broken, then the ego itself dissolves away. Just like if you, if you take away a certain number of bricks from a house, the house will collapse. So in the same sense, if you take away enough attachments, then the ego will collapse. And when that happens, in some people, there seems to be a, a latent higher self, which is waiting to emerge. Not in everybody, but in some people, this latent higher self seems to be totally ready to emerge. It's fully formed, just waiting for the opportunity. So when the ego breaks down, that's when this latent higher self has, to, has the opportunity to emerge. And I found that there were, there, were, there were certain qualities which some people have which seem to predispose them to this experience. Um, one thing I found, which may or may not be significant, is that women seem to be more likely to have this experience. I don't know what, I don't know if that's because women were, were more likely to, to share these experiences or whether that expresses some sort of psychological truth. But if, if there is something behind that, maybe it's because the experiences are related to a certain quality of openness to experience, a certain curiosity, being willing to let go and to trust new experiences rather than hanging on to or controlling your life as it is. But I also found that acknowledgement and acceptance were important. When, when many of us go through crises or challenges in our lives, we don't really want to accept the reality of them. You know, we, we divert ourselves from them. We try to avoid, um, you know, avoid contemplating them. But transformation is more likely to occur when you face up to the reality of the situation and when you accept the reality of the situation. So imagine that, you know, for example, bereavement is a good example. Bereavement has a lot of transformational potential. I actually did a research study specifically about bereavement. I found many examples of people who underwent a spiritual awakening after the loss of a loved one. And I found that it was more likely to occur when people faced up to the, the reality of the situation, the, the, the reality of their loss, rather than not contemplating it, um, rather than, you know, distracting themselves, distracting themselves from it. But if you really face up to the reality of the situation and if you accept it in all its, even though, even though that may, may seem painful, if you are willing to accept the reality of the situation and everything that it means to you and your life, then this transformation is more likely to occur. So a lot of people could pinpoint a certain moment when they accepted their situation. And that was when the transformation occurred. For example, one guy, another person who, who underwent transformation after a long period of alcoholism, he said that he, he underwent transformation when he reached the stage in the AA process where you hand over your problem. So his experience of handing over his problem to a higher power released him from the problem and was in effect a surrender or letting go. Another gentleman, um, told me about an experience he had when he was um, he became severely disabled following an accident. He became paralyzed, uh, wheelchair bound, and he was devastated, as you can imagine, really depressed about the change it had, the effect it had on his life. And for about 18 months, he was in a state of depression and, and bitterness and resentment. But one day he said that he was he was being taken for a shower in the morning by a nurse. And he heard a voice inside his head say, why are you hanging on? Just let go. 
just let go, man. Don't hang on anymore. So he made a mental intention just to let go at that moment. And at that moment, he underwent a shift. It was as if, as if a new energy began to arise inside him. And everything around him began to look different, to look more real. And there was a feeling of bliss inside him. And the sense of bliss seemed to spread into his surroundings. Everything seemed full of bliss. And that became, you know, that was the, that was the equivalent of a, a shift into spiritual awakening for him. Everything changed in that moment. And he, was, he had this new sense of acceptance towards his situation and this new sense of harmony in his life. Interestingly, just for one more thing about this gentleman, he, uh, up to that point, he'd been having um, a drip with, um, I think it was a morphine drip into his back because of his spinal problems. But after that, he felt as though he didn't need the drip anymore. He said that whenever he felt pain, he would just drop into, into this feeling of bliss inside him. And, you know, this bliss was just always accessible inside his being as long as he turned inward and let himself fall into it. So, um, yeah, so as, as, I, as I mentioned there, acceptance is, is a really important quality in these experiences. And it's also, it's a really important quality in human life in general. So I just want to mention um, the importance of acceptance for a moment. And I'd just like to, to end with a, a poem and a, a short meditation based on acceptance. Because acceptance can be an alchemy that can change our lives. It can change our perspective on situations. It can change our attitude to our experiences. And often it's a difference between happiness and discontent. Just, I'd like to read a poem called The Alchemy of Acceptance, which is partly based on these experiences of transformation through turmoil, but also it relates to acceptance in a more general sense. The Alchemy of Acceptance. Emptiness can be a vacuum, cold and hostile, dark with danger. Or emptiness can be radiant space, glowing with soft stillness. And the only difference between them is acceptance. A task may seem tedious, a chore to rush through reluctantly, or a task may seem rewarding, a process to relish with an attentive mind that reveals more richness the more present you become. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Trauma can break you down to nothing, destroy the identity you spent your whole life building up. Or trauma can transform you, break open new depths and heights of your being, give rise to a greater structure, a miraculous new self. And the only difference between them is acceptance. Life can be frustrating, full of obstacles, with desires for a different life constantly disturbing your mind. Or life can be fulfilling, full of opportunities, with a constant flow of gratitude for the gifts you have. And the only difference between them is acceptance. So let's, uh, just for a moment, let's close our eyes again. Bring your attention into your inner being again, as we did at the beginning, into your inner space. And as you as you are aware of your inner space, as you explore your inner being, just be aware of any area of your being 
where you may you, where you may feel some resistance towards any aspect of your life, any discomfort towards any aspect of your life. any negativity towards any aspect of your life. The next time you breathe out, just take a long, slow breath out and let go of any resistance or discomfort within you. Just make a mental attention to let go of any resistance as you breathe out. As you breathe out again, you can feel yourself moving into a state of acceptance. It's letting go of any feeling of conflict towards any aspect of your life. And shifting into a mode of openness and acceptance. Let's do that again with a few more breaths, a few more long, slow breaths, just letting go of any resistance, shifting into a mode of openness and acceptance. And now after the next, after your next breath, just allow yourself to settle and be aware of a feeling of harmony inside you, a feeling of acceptance towards every aspect of your life, a feeling of acceptance towards reality, itself. As if you have become one with reality itself. And now Let's slowly open our eyes again and bring this meditation, short meditation to a close. Just before I finish, I'd just like to mention that one important aspect of all of these experiences I've discussed is that I think they represent an evolution of consciousness. Evolution is not just about living beings becoming more complex and more physically uh, varied. It's also about living beings becoming more internally conscious, more sentient, having a, a deeper and larger inner life. And that's what spiritual awakening is about. Spiritual awakening is about growing inwardly and expanding your identity. So it represents a further continuation of the evolutionary process. It represents an expansion of awareness. So the fact that so many people are having these experiences, both temporary awakening experiences and permanent shifts into ongoing wakefulness, to me that, that suggests that there may be an evolution of consciousness occurring at the moment, that human beings may be undergoing a kind of evolutionary leap into a higher state of awareness. That's what I, I feel underlies these experiences, and that is why, partly why they are so significant. Okay, thanks everybody. <laughs>